Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President of the University of Delaware, Dr. Dennis Asanis. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I can't tell you how excited and honored uh, I am to be serving as your president, but also to, to welcome all of you. Uh, my wife, Eleni, and I are uh, here in the audience with, with you and all those of you who are attending this uh, virtually and uh, just want to say how much you mean to all of us, uh, bring the community together, especially post-pandemic and having events like this. Uh, it's really, really special to us. So thank you for, for attending. And uh, I want to especially uh, thank uh, our uh, very, very special guest, uh, uh, Maria Ressa. It's a true honor uh, to, to host uh, Maria, a courageous uh, journalist, a tireless advocate for human rights and a recipient of the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize. I want to express our sincere gratitude to Maria for taking the time to be with us uh, virtually this evening. And I'm saying virtually, we're so sorry that uh, Maria, you were not able uh, to clear all the courts. I know how hard you tried. I believe you, you cleared six out of seven and the seventh one was so stubborn, they wouldn't give you a visa on time. So, so thank you so much for trying and I know you promised me personally that you're going to come here live this fall. And I'm, I'm going to make sure, I'll talk to your leadership over there in the country and I'll make sure that you do. So uh, with, with that, uh, I want to thank everybody uh, here in the College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of Communication, the Office of Institutional Equity, for working with the President's Office to organize and support this event. So let's give all the organizers a round of applause. It is so fitting that we are gathered here at Mitchell Hall and virtually a few days before the World Press Freedom Day on May 3rd. As we all know, a free press is absolutely essential for a functioning democracy. In an interview, Maria, you said best, when you don't have facts, you don't have truth, you don't have trust. Trust is what holds us together to be able to solve the complex problems our world is facing today indeed. Institutions of higher education like the University of Delaware are also dedicated to the constant pursuit of facts and truth through teaching and research. That's what we're all about. We believe in the free exchange of knowledge and the free exchange of ideas, even when, and especially when, they may be disruptive to the status quo. These values are absolutely fundamental to the fulfillment of our institutional mission and to our commitment to addressing society's most vexing challenges. And yet we also know that these ideals are threatened in many places throughout the world. Misinformation, disinformation, censorship, and even physical violence and brutality are used to restrict the free flow of news in a growing number of countries, unfortunately. This is a dangerous trend for everyone. So it's critically important that the freedom of press is respected, protected, and expanded everywhere. It's also important that we support journalists like Maria who do this vital and sometimes dangerous work here and abroad. For nearly 35 years, Maria has worked as an investigative journalist in the Philippines and elsewhere in Southeast Asia. She ran the CNN bureaus in Manila and Jakarta for nearly 20 years and reported extensively on terrorism issues during that time. And, and Maria, I understand the highlight of your time there is meeting Ralph Begleiter that I will introduce soon at CNN. So that, that was amazing for both of you. So in 2012, she co-founded Rappler, a digital news site that is leading the, the fight for freedom in the Philippines. This work has made her the target of political harassment and arrest by the government. It's happening even today. And she has been forced to, to post bail eight times to remain free and continue her work as a journalist. Isn't that amazing? In 2018, Maria was one of the journalists named as Time Magazine's Persons of the Year for their tireless commitment to taking on autocratic governments and fighting disinformation. 
Time magazine also named her among its 100 most influential people of 2019 and one of its most influential women of the century, which is unbelievable. Let's give Maria a hand. But perhaps the most impressive of all so far, because there is more to come, I'm sure, is that uh, last year Maria was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize along with Russian journalist Dmitry Muratov for their efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, which is a precondition for democracy and lasting peace. So that's amazing. Again, a round of hand, please. <laughs> Maria's talk this evening is uh, titled Exposing Truth and Challenging Power. Maria will give her talk first. And then we're going to uh, ask uh, our own Ralph Begleiter, who is with us on stage, and let's give him also a warm welcome. <laughs> Ralph will join Maria virtually and will moderate the discussion, and uh, I'm sure it'll be a spirited conversation after a fantastic talk, I have no doubt, uh, from the audience and, and other people who want to pose the question. So let me just tell you a few words about Ralph, and uh, I'll keep it short because he also has a very long bio. So uh, Ralph uh, uh, is one of our very own. He is, has been the founding director of our Center for Political Communication, which is doing amazing work. Uh, and evidence of this is today, right? We wouldn't have the event without a Center for Political Communication. Let's give everybody a hand, and everybody in that department, including the chair, Kami Silk. So uh, he, he has been the Rosenberg Professor of Communication, and he brings more than 30 years of broadcast journalism experience to his award-winning instruction in communication, in journalism, and political science. During two decades, uh, CNN's World Affairs correspondent, and CNN was the only place that was giving nonstop news at the time, I want to remind you. Uh, Beg Leiter was the network's most widely traveled reporter, lots of frequent flyer miles. He has worked in 100 countries and in seven continents. I think you'd be interested to know that he has traveled with university students to Cuba, South America, Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, and Antarctica, and has conducted media training programs in several countries under the auspices of the US Department of State. Uh, he covered many historic events. I'll just give you a few that I think you might have heard about uh, at the end of the 20th century. Virtually every high level Soviet Russian American meeting, and notice I said Soviet and Russian, the Persian Gulf crisis in 1991, the Dayton Bosnia Accords, and the Middle East peace efforts. That's quite a resume, I think. Now, in 2008, he received the Delaware Press Association which, uh, uh, Award, which named him Communicator uh, of Achievement honoring a lifetime of achievement in communications and journalism. But more important to us, in 2015, here in the University of Delaware's Excellence in Teaching Award, and in 2009, the comparable honor from uh, the College of Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame. So let's uh, work, welcome Maria virtually and Ralph on stage. And thank you all, I'll attend the lecture. Please. These are the things that, that I'll cover in the next 30 minutes, right? That in the end, we are at this precipice. This year in particular, there are more than 30 elections around the world. You will have your own elections. I want to go through what happened, how did it change us as individuals, and then as democracies, as societies. And then finally, because I'm not going to leave you down in the dumps, you know, it, we're not going to be Joseph Conrad looking into the abyss. What can we do? Because we are doing something about it. And, and the question that really I struggle with, my team at Rappler has struggled with for the last six years is this. This question I ask you to ask yourself, what are you willing to sacrifice for the truth? And, and this is actually correct, that it is about the truth, right? Uh, I'm sorry, there are too many photos of me here, but I just wanted to show you that uh, I, I'm old. I've been a, a journalist since... 1986, so that's 36 years uh, this year. And I guess each decade, something shifts. But the reason I put this collage together for you is really to show you the impact of technology. 
So the black and white, aptly so, was like in in the late in the eighties when we could embed ourselves before the word embed was was um, was even coined. We could go somewhere to a neighborhood and be with them for weeks at a time, and um, and actually immerse, understand the culture. Right by the nineties, you had satellite. And coming from the Philippines, from Southeast Asia, it was quite expensive. So doing a satellite broadcast with Ralph would be, you know, oh my gosh, $10,000 for every 10-minute window. And then in my career, I watched that $10,000 for 10 minutes go down to hundreds of dollars, $200 at one point, right? So then that that next decade, the 1990s to 2000, you, you could see us live and we spent that meant as a, an on-air reporter, you spent less time with people you're covering. Um, I, I put up this this kind of photo of us uh, on Kembaya warfare because I felt like that was, I mean, the Kembaya warfare that wasn't. I'm sure Ralph has stories about that as well. But we did, CNN sent us for training. And, and then at the bottom, this is the newest country in Asia. We are actually... Uh, the anchor, Veronica Pedrosa and I are in East Timor at that point. Now it's Timor-Leste. Uh, the Nobel laureate, Jose Ramos Horta, just won a second, you know, a, a term as president just last week. But here we're standing on top of cargo containers that CNN brought in. We're live, right? Again, that is the incredible power of technology during that time period to all the way to the right, you'll see my newsroom in the Philippines of ABS-CBN. It is the largest newsroom in the Philippines. And in May 2020, uh, this administration, Rodrigo Duterte's administration, took away its franchise to operate on the airwaves. Uh, but I came home. I left CNN to head this newsgroup, about a thousand journalists. I learned a lot during that time. And then finally, in 2012, Look at this. I just wanted to show you how computer, how broadband all of a sudden could go with satellite and make it so easy to go live, right? This is our first office in 2012 in uh, uh, in Rappler. Um, I guess important is this, you know, everything is about trust. You just saw kind of through my lenses, the impact of technology in gathering the news, in broadcasting the news to you. But this is critical. Uh, part of what we did differently in Rappler was the pillars of journalism today, of our platform. And the answer for, for me in 2012, how we build trust was this. The three pillars, which to me also give us uh, a potential solution. These pillars are where I draw my kind of Pareto principle on how to live and work in today's world as a journalist, right? And the pillars are technology, journalism, and community, right? I'm going to remind you of E.O. Wilson, who's a biologist, uh, and he said that the greatest crisis we face are our paleolithic emotions, our medieval institutions, and our godlike technology. So look at the three pillars in that context. So I actually, as a journalist at core, I put technology first. And you'll see as I go through the presentation exactly why, because technology has fundamentally changed everything. And in many ways, we don't acknowledge that. So the solution is going to come from tech. Journalism is going to have to survive. And then our community, we're going to need to bring our community in. And I'll show you some of the examples. This is from a book by Sinan Aral to just explain our information ecosystem today and how we fit with this. You know, when we set up Rappler in 2012, my goal then was like to say, you know, I want to put a newscast in your pocket. That's how from broadcast journalism to the cell phone, right? But this is where we are today. And I'm going to, Sinan Aral is with MIT. I'm also an MIT fellow, but in here, in one slide, you can see the way he structured um, our information ecosystem. And let's just focus first at the, at the middle, the technology trifecta, because we tend to think hardware and software are all the same thing. They're not. And each of these are actually picking up data from you. That's really critical, right? So the first is the, the actual media, the smartphones you carry in your pocket on top of that, 
you have the substrate, the digital social networks that are going on top. And on top of the digital social networks is machine intelligence, right? So what do I mean by that? Everything you post on social media, if you're a student watching, right, you're going to post about this. But machine learning will come in and take every atomized post you have in a way that human editors couldn't. And they will take that data and create a model of you that knows you better than you know yourself, right? So then that model is sucked up by artificial intelligence. And we go from the content, which is what we see downstream, which is where most of the public debate is, to go up to the kind of operating system of our information ecosystem, which is algorithmic amplification, right? It's like the editor, because again, remember what algorithms are. I'm going to quote Kathy O'Neill in Weapons of Math, Math Destruction. She said, an algorithm is opinion in code. So it's like taking a reporter or an editor, Ralph, me, and then taking our opinion in code and then multiplying it a million times, right? So this is the gatekeeping power. They give it to an algorithm. Now, how does that algorithm work? It decides what it gives you, what it what gets shared the most. We go further upstream to the actual business model, something Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism, right? And what is that? And I'll talk about that a little bit more. That is all of our data, everything that you put in, right? Your atomized meaning in your life now owned by, I mean, the biggest ones are American technology platforms. So this is the technology trifecta that have created these trends. And, you know, this is, CNN is, is far more optimistic than I am because I've lived through the worst of the trends. But, you know, it's no longer like in broadcast journalism where we all see the same reality. This is personalized, personalized, meaning each of you in the room will get a different feed. And no one else will see that feed except you. But you're for sale, right? The way the, and this is called micro-targeting, whoever pays the most money takes your most vulnerable coin and sells you a message. So this is personalized mass persuasion, far worse than anything television ever did, which creates the next thing, which is hyper-socialization. Do we even know how to be alone today? That then creates the last, the tyranny of trends, Another way of thinking about this is um, ah, what we see, the emotions on social media. In the Nobel lecture, I called it toxic sludge, right? This is anger, hate, conspiracy theories, right? Well, all of this is designed to create moral outrage because that moral outrage keeps you scrolling on the site, right? This is what the site wants, profit, more money. The longer you stay, the more data you give, the more money the platform makes. So then what happens there is that we wind up giving more data. It's this harmful feedback loop that creates a tyranny of trends. Now, that's the bad news. What are the levers we can do to actually try to fix some of this? Well, money, the business model, surveillance capitalism, right? Maybe they should pay us for our data. Maybe it should be illegal. So these are some of the potential solutions, right? Because the things that you think of as separate, you know, content moderation, user safety, antitrust, data privacy, those are all connected to the business model, to the money, right? Code, the code that creates this, it's kind of like the building code, right? That code, that's another way that that's a lever. What if every coder has standards and ethics, right? What are the values of the machine? All of that creates norms, right? Right now, it's the wild, wild west, in, especially in America on social media, right? In the sense that, you know, um, in the last few weeks, finally, the European Union passed the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. So this is kind of something that you must think about because all of this has become a behavior modification system. And we are all Pavlov's dogs, experimented on in real time, creating new norms, norms that make us 
I mean, frankly, worse people. Right? Who wants to be ruled by anger and hate? And then finally, that goes to the last lever that's extremely important and something I called for in the Nobel lecture, the laws. Right? We need to put guardrails around the tech. If we put guardrails around genetic research, genetic technology like CRISPR technology, where we can essentially engineer a, an embryo, why do we not put guardrails around our minds, the manipulation of our minds? This is, sorry, it's a lot of stuff to say on one slide. Um, let me move forward. Here's my discovery of this. This is in 2016. It's a three-part series. It's part of the reason Rapport came under attack by the Duterte administration. We exposed this, how the administration, its supporters, along with the Marcos, uh, Ferdinand Marcos was ousted in the People Power Revolt in 1986. That is 36 years ago, right? So anyway, here we are in 2016. I wrote two of the three-part series that, that got us attacked online. But I want you to look at what my, my co-founder, Chai Hovilenia, did. Fake accounts manufactured reality on social media. I think this was the first time globally where we took a sock puppet network of about 26 accounts, all fake. But then we spent three months counting how many others on Facebook do those did that sock puppet network, that fake network, influence at least 3 million. So 26 fake accounts impacted could influence up to 3 million real people, right? And then, of course, how Facebook algorithms impact democracy. Uh, let me say up front, Rappler remains a fact-checking partner of Facebook in the Philippines, one of two Filipino fact-checking partners. Uh, you'll see you'll see what I mean later. This is the say, the network. So we started mapping the networks that were attacking us, and these were some of the attacks. So this is the network. Social network analysis became my greatest friend. It's Ralph would know because that was how I began tracking terrorists in Southeast Asia that were linked to Al Qaeda. You know, the two biggest stories in my career were were the discovery of. The mastermind of 9-11, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, he lived in the Philippines in 1994. I spoke to his girlfriend, right? So the discovery of this network in the Philippines, terrorism, this is the new terrorism, information operations. Anyway, so here we, we mapped the network that was attacking us. What were some of the attacks? It's very personal. So I warn you, I hope you're not eating anything. Um, I get this daily uh, on many comments. I wake up. And, and I go, oh, wow, how nice. So here's where, you know, memes just make fun of you. The way you look, the way you sound, the way you act. Um, uh, here, this is when I was convicted. And you can see, I hope you, you can't really see my face, but I have eczema, very dry skin. And what they did is they take this kind of machine, takes what they think is your weakest point and pounds it. Right, Because the end goal here is to pound you to silence. And this is the same goal, whether you're talking about Crimea or whether you're talking about the Philippines or whether you're talking about the United States. I'll, I'll talk about the methodology. Right. So the first thing is suppress. That means pound whoever you want to target to silence. And then the second thing is replace, suppress, replace. Right. So here, I think they thought that if they made fun of me if they, that I would shut up. Uh, hmm. Anyway, so here, this is June 15th, 2020. You know, be, they realized when they convicted me that, oh, there's a backlash. And so they came up with new memes. And then the next slide I'm going to show you is kind of ugly, so I won't keep it on for very long. They took my skin and, this, and started calling me scrotum face. So again, what is this? Dehumanizing. Because then when you're dehumanized, and this is very familiar from Nazi Germany, right? Then that is where violence happens. And please come with me. Online violence is real world violence. There's no difference in them. I'm going to move on to this, right? This is on Facebook. This is a page on Facebook. They even claim credit. Again, what they did is they made my skin look worse. And this is the, the PBS film, A uh, Thousand Cuts. But then look at the scrotum face, which is the meme they created for me. You know what? 
let me show you the study that was done. Let me bring you to June 15th, which is where these attacks kind of accelerated. So from 2016, after we did that story, for every reporter now that wants to actually do their jobs, you got to be ready for this onslaught. If you're a woman in the Philippines, you're attacked at least 10 times more than men. This is what our data shows. This is June 15th, 2020, when, you know, I have, I'll I'll correct one thing that um, that Dennis said, you know, I had 10 arrest warrants filed against me by the Philippine government in less than two years. So I've been a journalist for 36 years, and then all of a sudden, wow, she becomes a criminal. And this is how reality follows intent, right? On this one, I kind of knew I was going to be, this is a cyber libel case, a story that, you know, essentially the law that we allegedly violated didn't exist at the time we published the story. So I get Joseph Conrad or uh, Kafka. That's another one. I like the Kafka. I, I now know exactly how Kafka feels. But here, what's interesting is in order to find me guilty. So number one, Rappler was innocent. I and a former colleague, Ray Santos, who at the point when we were charged, he was actually working for government, right? So what was interesting here is that they actually changed the period of prescription for libel from one year to 12 years in order to find me guilty. Um, This is on appeal, but here's, here's the New York Times, what it said, conviction in the Philippines reveals Facebook's dangers, because why is that? You say a lie a million times, bottom up, with exponential, that exponential lie in the age of abundance, the age of social media, it becomes a fact. It becomes a fact, right? That's a big difference. And I think something that we forget. Um, Here's the study that they did, and this was both UNESCO and the International Center for Journalists. They did a big data study of the attacks against me. They took almost half a million of the attacks on social media. And what they did was to show, you know, in context of what everyone else was. So in this particular survey, 73% of women journalists said they experienced online abuse, i.e. I'm your micro, there's a macro, what we are feeling, you are feeling. Where we go in the Philippines, you will go. We are all connected. Um, 25% of that 73% receive threats of physical violence. I've had to increase security at least six times from 2016 to 2018. And then 20% had been attacked or abused offline in connection with online abuse, right? Online violence is real world violence. So the study that they did of me, here's what it showed. 60% of the violence um, just tried to attack my credibility. Like I, I said, I've been around for a long time, 36 years. So I always thought that, you know, at the beginning, I didn't respond to any of it. That's a mistake. Respond to every lie. Uh, but because I thought it was still the old world of traditional media. 60% to damage my credibility. 40% to kill my spirit. So this is happening to you. Understand that's the goal and don't let it kill your spirit. In fact, for me, these kinds of attacks is like waving a red flag in front of a bull. I'm going to show you two last things, right? So this is, we are uh, 12 days. Actually, as of today, let me just double check the, the, the number of days before our presidential elections. We have presidential elections. And, you know, how can you have integrity of elections if you don't have integrity of facts? So as of today, it is the 28th in the Philippines, the evening of the 27th in your, in your, where you are. Um, we have 11 days, 11 days. Here, this graph is a discovery of uh, the attacks against me on Twitter. And I'm showing this to you because look at that spike on, when is this? On December 29th, there's this spike of attacks against me. Whenever I see a spike like that, I know that it's a new information operation. And so what we did is we just compared it with the Twitter network and the creation dates of of Marcos Jr., who is, by the way, 36 years after his family was ousted by a people power revolt, is now our front runner for president. And part of the reason he is the front runner is because over the last, since 2014 until now, we've actually 
uncovered the data showing the disinformation networks that, that he's unleashed that has essentially changed history in front of our eyes. Ferdinand Marcos is now a hero, um, not a villain. And that happened. So here, this is interesting on Twitter. So we looked at the creation dates and we did, uh, we, we compared it with the kind of the pushback against historical revisionism, which is hashtag Laban Marcos. That hashtag is fight Marcos. Laban means fight. And uh, disqualify, hashtag disqualify Marcos, right? So what you can see is the red Laban Marcos is pro-Marcos, and then the gray ones are anti-Marcos forces. And you can, we just compared their creation dates. And you can see the difference between something that is manufactured versus real, right? The gray is kind of a, a group of accounts that were created over a long period of time. And then you see that spike that's pro-Marcos. And then we did a story on it. And we did this story in January this year. Um, uh, the disinformation networks of the Marcuses started as early as 2014 on YouTube and Facebook. Twitter has actually kept the handle on it because as soon as we gave them the data, they suspended the accounts. Now that Elon Musk owns Twitter, let's just see what will happen, right? But um, this is, and I'll bring this to you as I wrap this up, you know, um, What's happening in the Philippines is not separate from what's happening to you. We have elections. If we fall here, um, what's our, our elections is a Marcos against the widow, our vice president, Lenny Robredo, just like 1986 again, right? Another Marcos against another widow. And here we are repeating the cycles of history with technology, adding something that's completely new to all of us. We're living in a time where I cannot predict what will happen on May 9th on election day. But let me show you how your Stop the Steal was actually seeded, right? Uh, and how you were affected. This is this chart is from the Election Integrity Partnership. Uh, they actually gave me an idea of how to fight back in the Philippines. But this is stop the steal, hashtag stop the steal, right? Um, and again, it's the same methodology as the attacks against me, as the attacks in the Philippines, as the attacks in Ukraine, which is bottom up, exponential attacks, say the lie a million times, and then come top down. In this case, stop the steal, was introduced in August of 2019 in an op-ed on RT, right? When Putin invaded Ukraine, how quickly did the free world kick out RT? Very quickly. So here we go, op-ed on RT in, uh, in, on August 11th, Steve Bannon on YouTube. Um, he, Steve Bannon, um, Cambridge Analytica, you know, you guys know him better than we do it in the Philippines. The mainstreaming began YouTube was embedded in closed Facebook pages, in, in closed chats. And then Fox came up, Tucker Carlson, September 15th. And then you had QAnon drop October 7th. QAnon also has a link to the Philippines. Um, and then finally, in November, President Trump came top down and look, the violence that was unleashed. I'll say this one more time. Online violence is real world violence. Social media has become a behavior modification system. Another thing I used to say, even before the time of COVID, is that this is like unleashing a virus of lies into our information ecosystem. And that virus infects real people, right? So even if we put guardrails on the tech, it becomes really imperative to almost have, I mean, this is what we used to do with terrorists, right? You have a de-radicalization program. Let me not walk into your politics. Let me just go again to the solution and show you what we are doing in the Philippines. Tech, journalism, community. Um, I've testified in every country that has solutions for technology, for guardrails on technology, right? The EU, again, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, uh, they're ahead of the United States. I have in the Nobel lecture asked to reform or revoke Section 230. The attorney generals in the United States are moving forward. This is toxic. This is changing us. It is like an atom bomb exploded in our information ecosystem. That's one. 
put guardrails on the tech. The second is Rattlers building our own tech. Uh, we always did in 2012. So now we've rolled it out for elections uh, and we can talk about that more. The second is journalism has to survive. Journalists are under attack. You know, the old model where distribution and creation of journalism were one, that's no longer the case. And the gatekeeping powers went to the tech platforms, which means that even if you do fantastic journalism, the entire incentive structure for distribution actually is geared against good journalism, right? So it's part of the reason, even before the Nobel, I decided to accept the co-chair of the International Fund for Public Interest Media. It's important to help journalism survive. And then finally, the last part is community. You are a community and how I so wish I was there with you today, but here's what we are doing, right? So again, I'll summarize on here, new gatekeepers, they created upside down rules, they separated content from distribution. That's the world we live in. By design, the social media platforms spread lies faster than facts. This is a 2018 study. I will share it in, on Twitter after we finish. And it has become a behavior modification system. So how do you fight this? Go up. Stream all the way upstream. Don't start at content. Don't stay at content because that's what we're familiar with. Move to the algorithms of amplification and move to surveillance capitalism. And in there, you will see, you will deal with these four things that are identical. Antitrust, data privacy, user safety, content moderation. I'll leave you with what we did because we have elections in 11 days. And this kind of looks crazy. And for Ralph, it's something that we couldn't, I didn't do as CNN, as a CNN reporter. But what we did is we needed to have a whole of society approach, a fight against the virality of lies, right? So what we did is we organized our society with 16 news organizations coming together to fact check. There's actually a data pipeline that connects all of these, our communities, the news groups, ask our communities to send us the lies there are tip lines that come in. It's an American group called Midan. We're doing this in conjunction with Google News Initiative. So all of these 60 news groups fact check. And then when we finish the fact check, the pipeline takes it to the mesh. And that's what I call our civil society. What's there? Human rights organizations, business groups, the church, right? Any environment groups, any civil society group that cares about facts have become our partners. Um, we've never seen groupings like this. And what do they do? They share the fact checks because we journalists, we don't like sharing fact checks with emotions. And if you don't have emotions, it doesn't spread on social media. So this is the mesh. The mesh, you know, in that movie, Don't Look Up, it kind of, the planetary defense system comes up one by one. This is where it's a person-to-person -person defense. Each of us defends on our social platforms. And then we come together. Finally, the third layer is research. And this is from the, uh, an idea from the Election Integrity Partnership where we pulled seven research groups together. We looked at the data together. And then every week in the Philippines, we tell our public how they're being manipulated who is manipulating them, who is benefiting, and as close as we can, without being sued again, you know, um, who is doing it. Finally, the last layer, which is critical, because this is the layer that's been missing globally. Where is the law? If you don't have facts, how can you have rule of law? If you don't have facts and a shared reality, how can we come together, right? So here, you have legal groups from the left, center, right. You have the free legal, um, the free legal assistance group. You have the integrated bar of the Philippines, the Philippine Bar Association, and what they're doing is tactical and and structural, strategic litigation, and that is helping protect the people who are at the front lines. I call it the Avengers Assemble moment for the Philippines, 11 days before our elections. All of this I put together. This is this book to where we're trying to figure out, I've been trying as we've been fighting to try to figure out how do you stand up to a dictator? Because guess what, guys? This is your battle now. Thank you. I can't wait to take your questions. Thank you very much, Maria.
Thanks very much, Maria. I, I just want to say as a sort of a personal observation, uh, first of all, thank you for waking up so early in the morning to be here on our evening program. I have a very fond memory of communicating with you almost identically to the way we are right now through video screens, not, not in person. I think that was one of the last times that we, we did work together. Uh, but also remember doing it in the mid-1980s, and I would not have remembered it was 1986, but I'm sure now, having heard your remarks, that it was, when you were standing in front of Malakanyang Palace with the people power demonstrations happening all around you in the street, and there you are with a microphone talking about the protest, the pro-democracy protests that were taking place live. It was the first time with a brand new all news network in the world, the only one in, at the time, it was the first time that we felt we were covering a revolution live. And of course, as things unfolded, it turned out to be a revolution. Marcos was thrown out of office and uh, you had all those r reports of that time. That's a long time ago and a lot has changed for both of us, of course, uh, in the interim, not only in our lives, but in journalism as you've just described. I wanna follow up um, on two specific things that you mentioned. Uh, you said several times just now that what you're going through in the Philippines is what we're going through here in the United States. Maybe talk for just a minute about that connection because we forget, I think, Cambridge Analytica. We forget Russia's intervention in the 2016 election. We forget Cambridge Analytica's manipulation of elections, not only in the United States, but in the Philippines first, right? You were first, I think. You correct me if I'm wrong, of course. And meddling in elections in Europe, in the Middle East, and elsewhere around the world. Why do you say that what's happening in a little country most Americans pay very little attention to, like the Philippines, is our problem? Oh my gosh. So thank you, Ralph. It is so good to speak to you again. And I was so looking forward to being with you in person. Um, look, uh, when Cambridge Analytica broke, and it broke in March of 2018, um, the, the whistleblower, Christopher Wiley, uh, actually, when I talked to him, he, he said that uh, Cambridge Analytica and its parent company, it's, it was called SEL Group, had been operating in the Philippines years earlier, and that Cambridge Analytica tested these tactics of mass manipulation in countries like ours. And then if they worked, the word he used is that they ported it over to you, right? Again, ironic for me because it's exactly what the terrorists for 9-11 did, right? Um, I don't know if you remember the shoe bomber, for example, uh, Richard Reed, right? He tested these liquid shoe bomb through airport security in Manila. And then it popped up again in 2001, right? We had these, we had these interrogation reports from probably the first pilot that was recruited that by Al Qaeda. All right, let me bring it back. Um, why, is, why is the Philippines a testing ground for attacks against you? Uh, well, number one, uh, we're a former colony of the United States. Our constitution is essentially patterned after the U.S. constitution. Um, William Howard Taft was a governor of the Philippines. McKinley, I mean, again, these are names, right? Uh, so while you have Puerto Rico, we, we were protectorate colony. I think America's only colony at, at, at that point. Um, the other thing that I knew is through my career, even through the time when digitalization was starting, when we were all moving online, Yahoo, when, at the heyday when Yahoo was ahead, used to test its digital products first in the Philippines. And part of the reason is because, you know, this, as of last year, as of January last year, it had been six years in a row that Filipinos had spent the most time online and on social media globally. We tend to be first adapters. Like I remember coming to the States and, you know, in the Philippines, everyone is on cell phone and the, and the U.S. took just a little bit longer partly because your institutions work, right? Part of the reason we adapt quickly to the new technology is it helps us jumpstart, right? So for example, if the internet isn't working, well, mobile phone can get us on the internet. So right now, uh, I mean, in the, even in the last six years, we adapted to 
to the mobile phone far quicker than the United States did. So I think those are the three reasons. There's a common history. There's we are a country where uh, that's the other thing Chris Wiley and Brittany Kaiser, who who's also with Cambridge Analytica, what they said about the Philippines is that, you know, these companies and that would include the tech platforms, I would think, could test these tactics in our countries because they can do it with impunity. Rule of law is weak. Uh, what, what characterizes the Philippines? Endemic corruption, uh, weak rule of law. Uh, and in this kind of country, from the real terrorists like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi Youssef, the first World Trade Center bomber. Like, I don't know if you know that in 1993, uh, after he he bombed the basement of the World Trade Center. He went to the Philippines to train the Abu Sayyaf. Here in 1994, he and his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, came together with probably the first pilot of Al-Qaeda that Al-Qaeda had recruited. And uh, those interrogation reports were part of what helped us when we were both with CNN get these stories to CNN. Anyway, so let me end with... I. I had said this as early as 2016. The end of 2016, I was actually in in, um, in California at Google, and I was already warning because it was so alarming. I had never lived through anything like this. It's very insidious, and it's invisible to anyone except the person being attacked, right? And then all everyone sees is kind of like a bandwagon effect. Right? That's what astroturfing means, astroturfing, fake grass. And then with the bandwagon effect, it feels like it's real grassroots attacks or grassroots opinion, but it's completely manufactured. So in 2016, I was saying, this is very, very alarming. 2017, 2018, from 2016 to 2018, absolute impunity on the part of the platforms. Um, and here... December last year, I finished my prologue for the book, right? And my prologue began in 2014 with Crimea, because that was the first time we saw the dual reality that geopolitical power had to contend with. So power and money, completely upside down. This is the world we live in. It's already come for you, you know, but let me end with this, right? Our elections here, if we lose our democracy, which we may, um, we won't be the first and the only. What will happen, as in 2016, when Rodrigo Duterte was elected in May, it was he was, about a month and a half later, Brexit followed, and the dominoes tumbled. This time around, if we lose our democracy, the dominoes will follow as well. There are 32, 32 or 34 elections this year. They're critical. Right. And not just yours in November, but you have Kenya in South Africa. You have, well, France. So Macron got through. But um, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Brazil will have its elections as well. So there's a lot at stake for the world. And Madeleine Albright had her funeral just this morning there in the United States. Her, her book, Fascism, was a warning of what we're dealing with today. The other thing you mentioned in your remarks was uh, you said at one point that the technology algorithms know us better than we know ourselves. Speak for a minute to users or consumers in this room here of social media, as distinct from journalists who are uh, putting information on social media. Those of us who consume on social media, are we aware that the algorithms, that the Facebooks, the Twitters, the TikToks know us better than we know ourselves? And does that make us more than ever potential victims of manipulation in how we vote, what decisions we make about public policy, not just in our country, but even as we exercise our military power around the world or political or economic power elsewhere? Uh, that's, that's correct, Ralph. I mean, you know, what's so interesting to me is built into the, the technology platforms, um, they don't distinguish lies from facts. They don't distinguish fact from fiction because doing that, they never accepted being a gatekeeper. And now I think many more are, uh, are finally admitting that they actually do have editorial control. But think about the delays of not exercising editorial control, right? I mean, deep platforming, former President Trump, 
Why did that become such a huge deal? Because they allowed impunity of lies for so long. And those that impunity of lies literally changes the way people think. It changes our realities, right? So if they had actually like gatekeepers, like the traditional news groups, we didn't, we don't allow lies to come into the public sphere because we would be liable, right? A, standards and ethics. So I'm really waiting for the standards and ethics of tech platforms. I think that's critically important. Uh, we don't have a better business bureau for our brains. Um, it's, and then the second thing is, so if you don't distinguish fact from fiction, um, it's gotten even worse. They actually give preferential treatment for the distribution of lies over facts. You and I know how difficult it is to learn to write a good story, right? To learn to write a story to make people care. It, we spend decades in our careers learning the craft of journalism. We stand no chance when someone can just make up a headline and it doesn't have to be true. In fact, it's not true. Or they take a half truth and then make it a lie. So that's the first is that, you know, like ones and zeros, a fact is critical to a public sphere. A lie is destructive. And, and these platforms by design actually spread the lies faster and further than facts. And here's the other part is that it doesn't just spread content as in rational thinking content. It spreads emotion. It spreads hate. It spreads anger. If somebody is pounding you and pushing you to be angry, does that not make you angry in the real world? Isn't this the core of all of these other problems? What did Russian disinformation target in 2016 in America? Black Lives Matter, race, issues of identity. And hasn't this erupted because we have been pummeled by toxic sludge, right? Russian disinformation, information operations targeted both sides of Black Lives Matter. It didn't care about facts or truth. In fact, what it wanted is to make you weaker, and it did, because you, what we wound up, there's a great article in The Atlantic, like the Tower of Babel, right? We wind up arguing amongst ourselves with so much anger and hate that comes out in the real world. Um, and then finally, the last thing that you said, are we more prone to manipulation? Absolutely. Is this connected to geopolitical power play? Absolutely. The funny thing is, many, I have many smart American friends who say, no, 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 we won't be manipulated. It isn't about your rational thinking. This is a thinking fast, emotional. So Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, Journalism is a thinking slow process. Democracy is a thinking slow process. Thinking like this, talking, is a thinking slow process. Imagine if someone is pumping anger and hate. That's a thinking fast process. And anger actually spreads fastest. So this is, this is the dilemma we have. What has happened it is in each of our countries where democracies have become weaker, the, geo, the power play of the, in our case in the Philippines, the disinformation networks are, are Duterte and Marcos affiliated. They've taken over the center of our information ecosystem on Facebook. Um, but those directly connect to, in, in 2018, after the Senate Intelligence Committee released the data of Russian disinformation, we took it and found our link. And it was actually through a Canadian alt-right group. Right? There are all these other links. The, the individual power play in each country is connected globally, very similar to the way Al-Qaeda hijacked homegrown groups and then pushed them again into a global jihad. So this is literally changing our world insidiously. Um, Maria. It must stop, because it's our biology that's being manipulated. Maria, you have used with Rappler and other aspects of your career, but especially Rappler uh, most, most recently. You've used social media yourself to combat corruption and combat misinformation and combat dictatorship. Duterte uses it, the very same technology, to accuse you of things, to uh, file lawsuits, to, bring, to bring support of those lawsuits, to develop public opinion against you and to undermine your credibility. So let me ask a really simple question. On balance, 
do you think social media, which you would say you use for good and Duterte would say he uses for good, are social media a societal benefit or a societal detriment? As it stands right now, it's destroyed democracy. It's creating emergent behavior of the worst of human nature. You know, Ralph, in, in the Nobel lecture, I, I put a lot of thought into, you know, saying that this is like an atom bomb exploded in our information ecosystem. And because it is silent, because it is insidious, we can't even name it. The world can't come together the way it did post-World War II uh, to create global institutions. Um, so as it stands, it is creating emergent human behavior that will destroy us, frankly, has already destroyed democracies. There, we tend to, and this is part of my um, frustration with the way we cover the tech, because in many instances, we're all quite enamored. I think it's part of the solution. It must be because we can't put the genie back in the bottle. But right now, the governments, democratic governments, the United States in particular, has also abdicated responsibility. <laughs> Essentially, think about it like this. like It's a DDoS attack on our brains in the age of abundance, right? When you unleash this, and this is not a free speech issue because free speech presupposes a rational thinking, right? Free speech, which is what Brandeis had said, was from 1927, when it was an age of uh, scarcity of information. This is like a fire hose coming at you and you're just trying to get a drink of water from that fire hose. It's impossible to do that. So we need to stop these, these, these attacks on our brains. We need a better business bureau to stop the experimentation on our minds because it is literally changing what we think, how we move in our world. And as you saw on January 6, 2021, it foments violence. And, and actually, so by design, these social media platforms divide and they radicalize, right? And, and it's a simple algorithm that they use to divide. And I, I think it was a byproduct, but they haven't changed it. They use as a recommendation engine Friends of friends for each of us to grow our social media platforms. Sorry, long answer to it must change. This is, it's, it's untenable to be where we are now. It demands too much sacrifice from journalists like me. I mean, I shouldn't have to consider going to jail just to do my job. Now, I'm going to put you on the spot by asking you a kind of vision question for a moment, and then we're going to turn to our audience here in, at the University of Delaware for, for their questions. Having said what you've said about social media and having analyzed it as much as you have by dint of force, you've been forced into that situation where you have to uh, see how social media are interacting with your business as a journalist and your role as a journalist. Can you envision a social media environment which does two things at the same time, preserves the best of free speech, which it obviously can do, it's technically capable of preserving and encouraging free speech, without also facilitating uninformed, misinformed, unverified, hateful, and false narratives. Can those two things coexist in social media in your vision? Yes, absolutely. You know, the reason why it doesn't exist right now is because it's just tremendous profit. And because governments haven't put these guardrails in place. Um, the easy answer to that is there is a system of laws in the physical world, right? Why do we expect that the virtual world, the world of our minds, is different from the physical world? There's only one world. We only live in one world. And those same laws in the real world must be reflected in the virtual world. I think we fell for a myth that, that cyber is different. In fact, you probably need more guardrails in the virtual world. So, so I look forward to a time, and I hope it happens sooner rather than later, because the people at the front lines have no defense. Journalists, human rights defenders who are attacked like this, we have no defense against it because it is not rational, 
right? And it foments violence. People die in Myanmar. Both the UN and Facebook have sent teams, and they have both come out and said that Facebook enabled the genocide in Myanmar, right? I know this from covering Indonesia for CNN when Muslim Christian violence exploded in Ambon, and it was so tenuous. You do not want anyone manipulating people like this. And and we traditional journalists were held accountable for this, right? So, so a, a quick answer for you is um, in order to have that idea of the internet where technology is a force for good, the platforms are going to have to make less money. It's a given, but they never should have been allowed to use the surveillance capitalism model. And the only reason they did is because, again, I'll go, I'll talk, I think back to the 19th century when the commodity that business used then was labor, right? And the sweatshops, uh, the, in- the age of industrialization. And what happened? Governments had to come in, gov- and the U.S. government was very clear about this, and, and, and create laws to protect labor. Where well, what is commoditized in the age of social media is our attention. And this attention economy is linked directly in a way we never could do in television. This is linked directly to the manipulation of our minds. And the sooner lawmakers can can get their heads around this, the more, uh, the sooner our democracies can recover. And I hope that's soon enough because every day that we don't act on it, people die in countries like mine in the global south. All right, Maria, we're going to turn to our audience here at the University of Delaware. There are two microphones, one on each side of the stage. If you'd like to ask a question, and I hope you do want to ask a question, please step to the mics because Maria won't be able to hear you if we just do our usual system of having you shout out a question. So if you have a question, please make your way forward. While you are doing that, I'll follow up with another question for Maria, but please step forward and and think about your questions. Maria, um, Facebook, Twitter, other social media, TikTok, and other social media that I haven't mentioned by name are being used, and you mentioned RT earlier, which strictly speaking is not social media, but that's the Russian television network that also uses social media as part of its uh, propaganda operation. Things like that are used by authoritarians, including in your country, but we're now seeing in the Ukraine war, we're seeing it uh, being played out in real time uh, on a stage maybe a little more bigger, a little bigger and a little more visible than the uh, Philippine situation, Philippine election situation. Authoritarians are using these technologies as not as exemplars of free speech, but as exemplars of controlling speech, how to control speech. They're giving us almost a daily lesson in how to control people's free speech. Talk about that for a minute, a little bit. Uh, maybe a little bit, if you can, in the Ukraine context from what you've been seeing. I'm sure you've been watching it, too. Yeah, sure. You know, I, I dropped out for the first part of the oh, question, sorry. but um, I'll take the last, the last part of it. Um, Ralph, it's, um, you know, in Ukraine, because this was actually something I studied uh, when I was writing the book uh, in 2014, how... I don't know if you remember the, the doctor on and this was on Twitter and Facebook, a doctor who talked about the Jews in Odessa talked about he, he and his his tweets and his posts went viral. Right. Like he talked about how uh, they were being persecuted. Again, these narratives like Nazism, not even under under Nazism. Was it this bad? And uh, overnight it was translated into different languages. And then the next day, so after it went viral, I was reached by one of these in English on Twitter, right? And then after after it went viral, the next day, and I remember this day, it was like May 2014, uh, the Russia's uh, foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said the exact same narrative in Geneva at the UN human rights uh, uh, meeting there. And so that was for me, and I took, this Twitter, you know, and, and Facebook information operation, because again, it was bottom up and top down. And um, that helped create this dual reality. I gotta say, Crimea and, uh, and the Ukraine brought these issues to Facebook as early as 2014. Um, 
And I, I actually worry that, you know, eight years later, uh, Putin, President Putin of Russia uses the same meta narratives that were seeded eight years earlier to justify his uh, invasion of Ukraine. If the platforms had taken action in 2014, would we be where we are today? Mm, I don't think so. That's what I mean. This is the price we pay for the inaction of the platforms. Let me directly answer your question about how authoritarians use this, because I've seen this play out in the United States where the platforms say, but look, Putin actually took us off right now. Um, the Russians don't have any real information as if the, the information on, on the platforms are real information when, okay, so what's happened? Remember by design, it divides and radicalizes. Remember by design, the meta narratives are seeded years earlier. What made it different and how could Ukraine change it, right? What made it different are the people of Ukraine. What made it different was Zelensky when he stood up and inspired not only his people, but people all around the world. Why were they able to use social media then? Because they were at an existential point. I mean, frankly, I hope Filipinos come together in the same way because we are at an existential point, right? So that the fact that it was used for good is no reflection of the platforms. That's a reflection of the people of Ukraine and the people who were supporting getting the truth out, right? That there really was an invasion. That's one. Number two, the fact that the platforms are saying that, um, well, we must be a force for good because... Uh, Putin um, uh, took us down. out, censored this, right? Um, that's also not true, right? I mean, any President Putin has pushed the world to a brink that we've never been at before. And it's very clear that he also isn't alone, right? And this is where I worry. Tech is the last tipping point for Autocrats Inc., which country is working to allow, like Belarus, right? Would, um, who helped Belarus, the Belarusian leader to retain power? Russia. Who is helping Russia now? China. Uh, and again, you, you would find the, the more, the right words. China is trying to walk this delicate line to be a part of both worlds. It was interesting how the free world came together. Sometimes I'll say what's left of the free world, but it's interesting how quickly it came together. And that was because of the actions of real people. The problem is that real people have been desensitized. And this is a problem you'll face in your own elections. We need to realize this is a, a, a a person to person, man to man defense if you play basketball, but you know, women to woman. Uh, this is a person to person defense. Sorry, this is a long winded answer to your question because it's far more complicated. It, it isn't just authoritarians uh, shutting down tech, it isn't just tech being the bad guys. I, I think by design, we need to admit that these platforms need to change. And then all of the cascading failures will get better once that shift happens. But as it is, we're only dealing with the end. Let me go back to Egypt and where this all began in 2011. Uh, we lauded the platforms mm -hmm. then because they allowed leaderless revolts, right? Uh, but then very quickly, those same tactics were laid bare for autocrats to take over. And they did. Wael Ghanim, who was with Google, um, uh, you know, started warning as early as 2014 and 2015 that autocrats were taking over these platforms. No one listened. Um, and I didn't because I thought I drank the Kool-Aid, Ralph. I believed in social media for social good. So it breaks my heart to see where we are today. Um, but you can't give up because we're in the middle of the dark times and we got to walk out of it and make it better. Did I answer your question or you want something specific no, for the no, dictators? That, <laughs> no, that, that's fine. You, you did answer it. Do we have a question? Yes, we do have a question over here now. I know you're not going to be able to see them, but you should be able to hear them. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Maria. It's a very good narration. And uh, I could relate, like when you were talking about the stories from Philippines and developing countries, 
I, I was relating that with like my home country. I'm basically from Nepal, originally from Nepal. And there is one like local election going on. And uh, so based on the like, what news I follow, like uh, I see like uh, there is too much division among the political parties. And the, what I and all of us like uh, who are neutral are worried about like uh, political parties are creating their like uh, they call cyber military. So yeah. to defend like uh, their political thoughts, they are not using the mainstream media, but they are using like their cyber, like a cyber, you know, like the bullying things and to cope with those situation. And our fear is like, uh, I can see still people here in US in developed country, people believe in the, like uh, the mainstream news and like, a, let's say like a, we uh, read like a New York Times, we look at like a CNN, Fox News, like, but there is a situation in less developed countries, people are just believing on what they see in the Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, TikTok. So do you, do you think like uh, these mainstream media are dying in less developed countries in days to come? Um, l let me just intervene before you answer that and, uh, to, to throw in a little angle that I think maybe other people might not be aware of. There are many places in the world, many places, where the internet is in effect represented by Facebook or whatever they see on their phone. And there aren't mainstream media that anybody's paying attention to. So in some ways, the feed is all one feed. But please, Maria, go ahead and respond the way you would prefer to respond. No, that's great context to add, Ralph. And thank you so much for the question. And I, I got to see the back of your head, so it's good. Look. Um, the same thing is happening in every country around the world. And the challenge for, let's start with the incentive structure. The incentive structure that the social media platforms have done to get wider distribution um, is actually unleashing the worst of human nature, right? To get wider distribution, it has to be salacious to a degree. It, if, if it captures your attention, again, the attention economy, and if it makes you angry, you get wider distribution. If you have values, you know, if you are a candidate who doesn't want to use anger and hate, if you're a candidate who, who wants to bring together people rather than divide them, you're already at a disadvantage. That's the first. How do you deal with this, right? Um, I would say the United States just barely... Um, got through this and, and it isn't over. Um, so the, sec the second part is um, you don't wanna be a monster to fight a monster, which is kind of what this is, but because the rules have been made by companies that are doing it for their profit, we all have to dance to that too. So in terms of the impact on traditional media, uh, traditional media has, has now been atomized to page views, right? I feel bad for the people who run the business of media because you can't compete when it's page views, atomized page views. That's part of the reason the quality of journalism goes down because we need to spend money on Ukraine right, to bring people there. The debate in America now is now it reminds you what real journalism is. It always was. But the incentive structure of the social media platforms weighed against real journalism. It was too boring. It was too thinking slow. Uh, it wasn't, it was like the vegetables you needed to eat in order to be able to understand your world, right? Um, it's easy to have cheap calories. So that's the second part. The quality of journalism is being pushed. The, the journalists organizations that will survive are the ones that are playing by the platform rules. Um, in Nepal, in the Philippines, in India, any candidate can now bypass the tough questions of journalists. We see this with Ferdinand Marcos Jr. He travels with his own vloggers, with different groups that have the facade of news. They have somebody that looks like an anchor, but is actually propaganda. That's the third part that makes me insane. I hate it when people call journalists content creators. <laughs> We're not content creators, right? 
courage to speak truth to power, to ask the tough questions. Journalists learn to do this our entire lives. So back to Nepal and, and what to do with elections. This is why I think the world is at an existential moment. And as you know, it's very personal to me. I think, you know, if we don't have rule of law in the Philippines, what does that mean for my life, right? Because I'm going to fight these cases. But back to the elections. Um, I'll end with this, right? It goes back to the people. I don't know what we're going to do, but I do know that the core problem is legislation. These platforms, Shoshana Zuboff, who coined the term surveillance capitalism, actually said that using this kind of um, the, this kind of surveillance capitalism structure is like using it's like the slave trade. She compared it to the slave trade, where we are being sold for profit because it is our minds that are being sold. Another guy, Tristan Harris, said that it's like you went to a psychologist. And then the psychologist took your deepest, darkest secret and said, yo, I got this. Who'll pay for this? Right? That's kind of what's happening. So is this legal? That's the first question. How do you protect us is the second question. The insidious manipulation of this attention economy hits everyone because it's insidious. It bypasses our thinking mind and goes directly to our biology. Here's the upside, the last upside, <laughs> because I can't leave you with it's devastating, frankly. The upside here is that it's shown that people all around the world have far more in common than we have differences. Our biology, the same, the same manipulative tactics are being used against all of us around the world, regardless of country or culture, right? So I, we set up rapper because I looked at the way the virulent ideology of terrorism was spreading. And I thought, if the terrorists can do that, then why can't we use them as forces for good? Those same questions can be used that way, but it will require enlightened self-interest on the platform's part. They've got to moderate the greed. That's a phrase that's really popular in the Philippines. Moderate the greed, it was connected to corruption. Um, investigations, moderate the greed. Uh, and then the second part is they've got to, the governments actually need to kick in because they don't allow the testing of drugs, for example, among a mass base of people. Your government has allowed the testing of the manipulation of our minds globally. Maria, we have another question here in the uh, audience at the university. Go ahead, please. So uh, earlier in your speech, you talked about how the world hasn't been able to come together um, on the social media issue, like as they did um, after World War II. So do you think that we're going to need another crisis like this um, in order for the world to come together? I don't necessarily mean a war, but like some kind of like global information crisis, or do you think that we'll be able to kind of curb the problem before something like that happens? All yours. To be determined. You know, it really depends. Um, that's why, look, uh, this is how I cope with where we are. There's something very exciting about this time that we are living in because we have the opportunity to create the world we want. Because the world as it was has already been destroyed. We just need to take that into our hands. And um, in a weird way, part of the problem is that the governments, the old power structures haven't kicked in. Uh, so it leaves the brunt of fighting this kind of disinformation to each of us on the platforms. That's not tenable. Um, in the Nobel lecture, I wanted to make sure that I included the good with the bad because look, I don't want you to give up. We can't, we have no choice. We must keep going forward. And I reminded, um, in the first, like, one minute, I think, in the first minute of the Nobel lecture, I reminded everyone about the goodness of human nature. This is the part that always uh, saves us. You know, post-World War II, it saved us from nuclear destruction. Now, what will it, it must, I hope that we come together. Um, you're there, right? What are you doing on social media? Join, create a mesh. You know, we can't wait for governments to do it alone. 
we must demand this. But oftentimes, as we've known, uh, every democracy is, is fueled by the will of the people, supposedly. What if it isn't, um, what, what if we're being insidiously manipulated, which we are? What happens to free will, which we already know? We have the data from all of this. What are we going to do? That's the question. What are we going to do? In the Philippines, I gave you we, what we did. We did a four-layer pyramid, and it's succeeding to a degree because within two weeks of rolling out this pyramid, so I saw all the metrics that came out of it. We shared it with our partners. But within two weeks, the Solicitor General filed a petition at the Supreme Court to try to shut down fact-checking, calling fact-checking prior restraint, right? So anyway, to go back to your question, um, to be determined. This is it. This is Avengers Assemble moment, right? This is the time. Please don't sit back. Don't sit back. Lean in. Find a solution. You have more power than we do out here. All right. We have another question here. Please, sir, go ahead. Hi there. I just wanted to say thank you for coming to speak to us at the University of Delaware. Uh, my question is, uh, we've seen over the past few years how important, accurate, and digestible, uh, digestible medical journalism is to public safety. In the context of climate change, another public safety issue, what advice do you have for scientists for their science communication to combat against mis- and disinformation within today's media framework? Thank you for the question. You know, these are the existential crises I think we're facing. Climate, so I, I put it this way, truth or facts, um, health, climate, and all of them are, you know, they're threatening to destroy us, right? If And I think if we cannot win the battle for facts, we will lose it in both health and climate. The networks of disinformation, and there's some DC groups that have done this research using CrowdTangle, uh, where they showed that the top 10 in terms of getting disinformation out. They showed the networks, the, the accounts that were doing it. And these are recidivist networks. What's so interesting to me is we follow this globally. And you know, before COVID, when there was an outbreak of measles, uh, the Philippines had three times the growth of measles. In the United States, there were states that had increases um, in incidence of measles, and it was connected to the anti-vaxxers. Right. Which, again, that phrase came up during COVID a lot more. Right. But these same networks of political disinformation is also where the conspiracy theories travel. And so this is connected. We need facts in order to create a shared reality where we can begin to look at whether or not we have the right health information in COVID. Look at what's happened globally, right? There are Americans who don't believe in the vaccine. Um, and how did that happen? The same networks of disinformation. Um, and then finally, climate change, which is your question. For a long time, journalists kind of, they're journalists who did the he said, she said, the false equivalents. That early problem has become even worse because on the platforms that deliver the news, I forgot to tell you this, the world's largest delivery platform for news is Facebook. The world's largest delivery platform does not distinguish fact from fiction. So it delivers news to you and it downgrades the facts. So how are we going to deal with climate change? You asked me a question as if um, you wanted to, you're a content creator for for climate change. Um, we need to create real world spaces. Here's the other thing that happened in the Philippines um, as a response to the information operations online. Filipinos started volunteering to go house to house to actually get information to the people. We went back to the real world. I don't know if it's enough, but this is again the same thing. So, Because if you play by the rules of the platforms, I'll, I'll say this very clearly, clearly. It will spread some. It's like drinking a poison pill. And look, Rappler is still on all these platforms because I've actually quantified what they bring to it. But if you only play by the rules of the platforms, then you will have to make it like memes. 
you will have to cater to the attention span of a goldfish, which was far less than what we had when we were doing television, Ralph. You know, it, it used to be like about the it first. Then. <laughs> right. And now it's the attention span of a goldfish, right? Um, so I, I can't, I just feel like forcing these complex issues into a thinking fast distribution platform is wrong. So my advice here, build communities of action. Um, and we're going to have to live through these very turbulent times. I could give you all of the things we learned in Rappler. How do you capture people's attention? But then you'll be playing and giving more oxygen to the very same platforms that are devaluing meaning and killing our rational thought. All right, Marie, we have several more questions here and your time is running out, So, but I'd love, love to give everybody an opportunity, so I'm gonna ask you to uh, give us shorter answers here. Go ahead, sir, please. And we'll make these the last four, okay? Uh, Maria, uh, thank you again for coming out to, uh, to speak with us here at, at UD. Um, my question is just a bit on kind of the uh, individual's um, ability for, for a, um, <clears throat> agency, whereas we may think as though we have a bit more control over our thought processes when we're engaging with social media than we actually do. So that kind of thought of insulation, that kind of third person effect of I'm not going to be affected, but maybe others who may be less intelligent or less um, crafty than, than I will certainly be affected. So how much do, of that kind of personal uh, insulation of being immune or impervious to these effects may, might play into this uh, problem in your opinion? I love your question and thank you. And I'll keep it short. I'll do TV sound bites now so that we can get, <laughs> we, we can get them all in. Um, in the real world, before social media, Framingham, Massachusetts had this huge uh, data uh, of a heart study. And what they showed, this is from a book called Connected. Nicholas Christakis is a, uh, did this study. Um, and he showed that emotions in the physical world travel through three degrees of separation. So, you know, even smoking behavior, if you're a smoker, your, your friend the first degree, your friend's friend, and your friend's friend's friend, you will feel the influence of that person. This is part of what's fascinating to me when I was studying the spread of terrorism, right? So in this case, you know, even an emotion like loneliness spreads through three degrees of influence, right? So think about it like that. We don't see it until we look at the data because uh, there are lots of psychological studies that have shown, you know, an individual in a group with peer pressure behaves differently than they would if they were alone. This is the Milgram study, Solomon Ash did these studies where, you know, uh, even though you know, uh, there was the line study, you know which line is shorter, but because the test cases actually called the longest line. So so the interpreter, the, the, the guy who's running the study asks you for the shortest line. It's clear what the shortest line is, but there are five people ahead of you who actually say the other line. And, be, and, and that's a battle, right? So the group behaves differently. And then finally, the last part is emergent human behavior at scale, how cities behave. And this is why you look at people like E.O. Wilson, who studied emergent behavior in ants. What a long-winded answer. I promise TV sound bites. Let me, let me do I'm this. I'm going to give you a wrap. It's our biology. Yeah. The wrap here, uh, the three bullet points when you do this. Number one, we are all the same. Number two, it impacts our amygdala, our emotion. Number three, we don't have any kind of immunity to this if it is hitting that. The only way you can pull out is to actually not share, right? That's one way. And actually verify it. But Stopping the anger and the hatred is very difficult. So, you know, please form these communities in the real world where we begin to do that. But how did, how did Black Lives Matter explode? How did Asian hate explode? All of these things are getting pumped on social media. And, I, and now I sound like social media is everything, but it isn't, right? It's just adding like the devil and the angel. It's 
you know that commercial before that, it's a cartoon sorry that a, it's a cartoon where you're making a really tough decision on your conscience the angel you listen to the angel you listen to the devil well in the age of social media the angel is gagged and kicked off your shoulder and the devil has been given a megaphone directly into your ear and it's like three feet tall so <laughs> i'm just saying be careful okay all right we're going to switch over here yes um I, this isn't, I don't know. Anyways, um, what would you say has kept you motivated through everything that you've been through doing all your years of reporting and all of the things you've been through with the Philippine government? Like, what keeps you motivated? I, I want to amplify that question. It was what I was going to end with tonight anyway. Uh, so let me just throw into it. You, I know, have had a n numerous experiences in your long career as a journalist that have been tremendous highs, tremendous accomplishments, tremendous successes that have kept you at this battle. I'll just add that to your question and tell, give us a little bit of, especially those of us who are interested in journalism as a career, uh, some kind of hope that this is a career that is fascinating to be in, worthwhile being in, and has a productive result. Oh my gosh. So two, th two things. I, I promised TV soundbite. I didn't do it. Um, uh, I think Ralph, we have been witnesses to some amazing historical moments. Uh, I will always remember the end of almost 32 years of Suharto in Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim population, you know, and then, and then after that, uh, a president for every year, like the amount of change. I remember like computers going from a thousand dollars to a dollar because of the the devaluation of the rupiah to the dollar right so we lived through these amazing moments of history uh, what an extreme privilege to be able to do that we live with we work with colleagues all around the world this is something cnn gave me and you get a view of the world that is extremely connected that's another big point you get to see the triumph of people who sacrifice so much for so little. Okay, I'm getting emotional. You can't do this on air. So that's why I stay a journalist. And then and this connects to my answer to the second, to the first question, which is, you know, what gives you courage? Um, by the time I came under attack in the Philippines, which wouldn't have been in 2016, I've been a journalist long enough that I felt like my entire career was like, training for the marathon that the last six years have been. I'd been to the gym. My muscles were, you know, I knew why I was doing what I was doing. I knew the standards and ethics. I knew immediately what the right thing to do was. I didn't have to think about it, right? I'm turning 59 this year, guys. I'm old, right? So in this sense, I felt like, okay, and why? I learned this when I was an immigrant kid in Tom's River, New Jersey, when I was the only brown kid in my public school and you know what you learn is that you are your own worst enemy that you have to and this is the phrase I use all the time embrace your fear and so I took the time to embrace my fear um, when I got convicted I pretty much thought I was going to be convicted not because I did anything wrong, but because the vacation may even have gone to court, but because of the context of where I am. So I embraced my fear. In fact, I thought of an even worse case scenario. And so when the verdict came, I was prepared for it. Um, this is what we do in Rappler. We think of the worst case scenario and then prepare for it. This is something we used to do when we walk into a war zone. Ralph, you know this. Right? So that's great training for me, like I said. So why do I do it? Because this time matters. There is so much at stake. Please don't sit back. Jump in. We need your help. Okay, we have two more questions here. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Uh, hi, uh, Maria. Thank you so much, like every other uh, person that's come up to ask a question, for being here today with us. Uh, my question is based off of uh, at the beginning of your presentation when you said from 2016 to 2018, your company had to up the security six times. I was wondering when that was happening in the company, when you would go home, were you scared for your own life and how did that affect your daily life outside of the company? I mean, thank you for the question. Um, scared is the beginning of it. Right. Like at the beginning, especially when it's uncertain, like the first time I was arrested, 
the first time I had to post bail, the first time, all those firsts are all brand new. And at that beginning point, you have no precedence to look at. I learn experientially as well, right? So uh, um, in terms of safety and security, I, uh, I just thought of the worst and prepared for it. By 2017 or 2018, I, had, I was wearing a bulletproof vest in the streets of Manila because, um, because we prepare for the worst, right? Uh, the scared is the beginning, but then how you get over it, you embrace your fear and you plan. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, imagine if your entire news organization, if you're in the news group, and then your boss says, by the way, this could happen, and this we need to prepare. Like, the first thing that happens is everyone gets scared. I prefer we get scared together so that we talk about it, we think about it, and then we, once we embrace it, once you embrace your fear, then you can plan how you're going to react to your worst case. So I guess that that's a long-winded answer to your question. I think part of it is huh, I have a tendency to sublimate my fear because I've been a reporter. Ralph knows this, right? Which crazy reporter stays in a war zone when people are shooting behind you? You learn, right? You learn. And so I think that's the other part that the government forgot. My um my appetite for risk is was was honed by CNN. I was a conflict reporter for CNN, and I prepare for this. And our team now, I got to tell you, remember the goodness of human nature? It, I think people will surprise us every time if we give them a chance. And so that's what I'm hoping. Hope. <laughs> All right, we're up for our last question. Please go ahead. Hi, Maria. It's an absolute honor to um, hear you speak. And like everything you've said, it's, it's some of the most insightful stuff I've heard in a long, long time, especially about the field of journalism and whatnot. Um, I actually had a question about like um, yellow journalism in the sense that in the wake of increasing polarization and in the, in the wake of increasing, um, what, um, what's, what's the word again? I'm, I'm sorry, it's on the tip of my tongue. I had it in my mind. I'm so sorry. Um, it's okay. Just um, increasing polarization between like um, the so-called duopoly between like leftists and rightists and such. Uh, and if the whole if the whole point of journalism is to afflict the comfortable or, or, or comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, and uh, like what would you say would be the best way of combating said polarization and finding that common ground? Thank you. Go ahead. Um, you Thank you for your question. You know the way we bypass it. Because I feel like so much of our energy is dealing with the, with the effects of cascading failures, right? Like, so the polarization was something that was built into the design of social media. But why not fix first, go to the core of the problem, and then we can begin to fix it? Because it's almost like if we don't fix the problem, even as we begin to solve it, more new problems are emerging, right? So you see my downstream and upstream again. How do I, how do we aim to solve it in the Philippines? Facts first. Let's stop, let's stop yelling at each other because that's how you stay online. And the other thing I realized, and you know, again, January 6th was such a strange thing to watch from here. Um, to see that, right, is, is shocking for everyone else around the world. Um, but in general, when people are face to face, when uh, when I am talking to a Duterte supporter, they're not. You can you can then be human together. So that's the first. I think these real communities. Let's bring it back to the real world. But the first, I guess okay, I'm I'm stumbling my way into the answer. Answer number one is let's fix the core problem, which is the manipulation. Let's put guardrails around the manipulation so then we can deal with the polarization. The second step is once you fix the platforms, the incentive scheme for the incentive structure to reward us against them, leadership goes away, right? Before, in the past, we elected leaders who could bring us together because that's the only way you solve problems, right? You create the shared space where you agree on the facts, and then you, you kind of duke it out. 
but it, you don't duke it out insidiously. You talk to each other and it can be boring, but that's how we create the solutions. So that's what needs to happen again. And that is a thinking slope process. So we need to be in a space where we can begin to do that again. Otherwise, look at how difficult governance is. I feel sorry for for governments who are trying to do the right thing because the very communication platform that they're using to get to the people is corrupted. That's what we need to fix. All right. I'd like everybody to please, let's say thank you to Maria Ressa for being here at the University of Delaware. We're very, very appreciative of your time and your insight uh, this evening. All of us wish you well. We look forward to the day when you do come to visit us in person at the university, and we wish you well in your legal battles as well there too. And I salute you personally for our uh, long career of association. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming here this evening. Appreciate it. President Asanas, thank you for your support.